Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Transmodalizing with Technology in Science. We are pre presenters from George Mason University College of Education and Human Development, and welcome to the webinar. Uh, this is our team. We have Dr. Sujin Kim, who is an assistant professor at Mason in the School of Education. I'm Dr. Kathy Ramos, associate professor in the School of Education. Uh, Cynthia Graville, who is join, joining us from St. Louis University, and our two doctoral students, graduate research assistants, uh, Sylvia Chen and Eden Langston. We are recording this session, okay, and this is the agenda for this evening. We're going to explain a little bit about what we mean by transmodalizing with technology in science, or TTS. We'll talk about infographic teaching and learning and information about the TTS project. We'll explain a pilot infographic lesson that we did with the, our partner teachers in the fall and the main lesson or infographic work that took place in the spring of 2023. Uh, we'll share some implications and then have time for questions and answers and insights. Hello again, uh, welcome to our session. And so first, we would like to start by highlighting what we mean by transmodalizing pedagogy. So in the next slide, uh, as teachers of many English learners or who we prefer to call multilingual learners, we are all aware using multiple modalities to teach in the classroom is proven effective and beneficial for all learners and even more so for our language learners whose English proficiency is in the developmental stage. So if the teachers facilitate students learning not only through the medium of language alone, but also through activities that involve other modes such as visual images, bodily gestures, audios, videos, and tactile materials, for example, they can provide multiple pathways for our students to understand challenging content concepts. And by transmodalizing pedagogy, we highlight a more purposeful designing process of such multimodal sequence of teaching and learning by coordinating and transitioning across different modal activities to make the content more accessible and also to augment students' understanding of the complex layers of what's being presented. And one such uh, motor coordinating tool is using technology like infographics. And in the next slide, so we argue that such transmodalizing pedagogy with technology in our time aligns to the body of research focused on science literacy and also to WIDA, English language development standards framework that acknowledge how multilingual learners can benefit from intentional integration of full linguistic repertoires and varying modalities for classroom learning. So this framework also recognizes and that as a discipline, science is inherently multimodal all the time. As we can see, it's communicative representations such as graphs, diagrams, geometric shapes, signs, body movements, and other artifacts. Fundamentally, uh, this emphasizes that science learning and literacy development takes place as multimodal participation in the classroom practice. So in the next slide, our colleague will talk a little bit about what infographics is. So I am, my background is in design and informal science education. And the question is why use science infographics? It's a form of design and narrative that's been increasingly utilized. I tell people that infographics offer a different modality that's authentic. So infographics are something that exist in the real world. There's something that science literate citizens are going to have to interpret. Um, students have inherent sophistication of visual design because of so much design that is consumed both in kind of a school context, but also in their day-to-day -day relevant to their life context. Uh, they're, like I said, infographics are very popular. So in addition to creating infographics, having the idea of science visualizations as a topic that's discussed when dealing with the content and also um, additional languages all interwoven, you're able to bring up topics of bad design on ethical data visualization, which unfortunately used to be 
a bit more of a stretch for me to teach even in my undergraduate classes, but really I think the deluge of data that came through COVID and the way that people proactively use numbers to tell narratives that perhaps were not totally true, uh, it's a very ripe area to begin to have conversations with students about science in the context of their lives. Um, and also multilingual learners are used to having language and different forms of com communication not just be you know the water that they swim in it's something that they have to be conscious of because they're moving between languages and i think that that sets the stage for a different kind of communication style of, of graphic design of using visuals of making data visualizations um, it offers an opportunity for that skill set that inherent expertise to be tapped into so Infographics are contextualized data visualizations. So there's data visualizations that have kind of risen with the machine learning and AI and all of that, where computers just try to find patterns. But infographics are a little bit different because you contextualize the story, the numbers, into a holistic kind of idea so that someone walking up to an infographic, just like a news article, they can understand the whole thing. And this is my favorite thing. If you ever meet any of my undergrads in any of my classes, I always say design is another form of communication. It's just like reading and writing. It has multiple forms and genres, purposes, consideration of audience, grammar style, flow, and purpose and rhythm. And I think all of those things together help students to contextualize science and life. And that brings me to my next slide which is how do infographics foster science literacy? So the process of creating an infographic is really similar to the way that all of us use science, that we take up science in our everyday life. We have a topic that we're interested in and it's personal to us, why do we care? Sometimes we wanna think well, why anyone else in society would care about this particular science topic, so you research it. And this could be a health topic, it could be how to prepare your family for an emergency, it could be researching your next car. So again, you're bringing in the kind of the societal element when you're doing your research, but also the scientific part of whatever it is that you're thinking about to make an infographic for. What does science tell us about this? What's the background? What's the most agreed upon research? And you get in a cycle of having feedback from an expertise. If you're making something in a journalistic sense, it would be your editor. It's often your teacher or other adults that are kind of involved in this. And then you organize and visualize your information. And through this process, you're actually doing the same things that scientifically literate citizens do when they're trying to make decisions around scientific topics. What health treatment do I do again? You know, you try and figure it out and you continue to process the information into manageable chunks. And with infographics, you take those ideas a little bit further and you authentically organize them and visualize them for an audience in a way that doesn't always get to happen, particularly in the younger grades because you make things for teachers. But infographics, it's so concentrated on serving as a proxy for your future potential audience. So it's not just to turn something in, it's like, well, if younger grades are gonna be looking at this, can they understand it? Am I making sure that all my sources are reliable? Am I making sure that I'm not just decorating my page because I love that clip art palm tree, but anything that I add onto my infographic is there to help this audience that I'm serving as a proxy for to further understand one of the things that drew me to this project as a designer was the idea that students who are multilingual learners have this understanding of language that I've had to pay people to do into some of my graphic design before, but being able to translate between languages to serve even more as a proxy for people who speak different languages, that's, I think, one of the really just I'm tired, it's been a long day, so I'm gonna use the word nifty, but like just one of the really great parts about this project, it's like, I can't tell you how many like times I've had to pay to have translators and here's kids who have this expertise and understanding between different languages to build that into these infographics, so. So before we move on, we wanted to take a moment to acknowledge that all of our hard work and everyone else's collaboration for TTS could not be done without 
funding from Spencer Foundation with us at George Mason and in partnership with those at Prince William County Public Schools, um, more specifically our STEM and um, our ESOL teacher pairs. Now to move on, we're going to briefly introduce just the general timeline, which we did begin in the fall of 2022 with infographic training modules and workshops with our teacher pairs, where we learned to design and implement pilot lessons with students in the late fall and early winter. This then transitioned the spring semester into additional TTS lesson implementations in the classroom, which my colleagues will talk about further um, specifically throughout this um, presentation. So um, we also wanted to talk about the demographics of our school, with which we are. It is in Northern Virginia. And additionally, it has a 90% minority enrollment with most of those students hailing from Central and South America speaking Spanish. There are other languages represented in our specific classroom that we have been present in with Spanish as the predominant secondary language, but also Arabic and um, Turkish present as well in the classroom context. Then furthermore, our two specific teachers we're looking in our classroom pair today are a coming from a background of a wealth of knowledge. They either have five years or upwards of 20 years of teaching experience, which is amazing. They both have teaching experience in different demographics publicly and privately, as well as different academic content areas. In addition, they have experience um, culturally teaching in other countries, as well as other places of other languages too. Okay, thank you, Eden. So I think that's me. I'm going to talk a little about little bit about the pilot infographic lesson. And as Eden explained, an awful lot of work went into um, just fostering the idea of infographics as a teaching and learning tool with these uh, wonderful teachers uh, from our partner school. And so after a lot of learning in person and online, uh, we had them kind of try it out and in the fall. So they uh, shared with their students some models of infographics, looking at the way that they tell stories for a specific audience, for a specific purpose. And then uh, being the really wonderful teachers that they are, they figured out a way to make it meaningful for the students and have it tap into something that the students needed to do anyway. So these are fifth grade students who would be taking uh, the science uh, SOLs, and so they wanted to really reconnect them with some topics from fourth grade that would also be, uh, they would be encountering on those tests. So they asked the students to choose a science book from fourth grade, a topic, and to identify five questions that they wanted to seek answers to from the text. And then they asked the students to create an infographic uh, that could relay the information that they, uh, that they researched and read about and they uh, condensed their answers into their first attempt at infographics. So they had a couple of days to read and research. And really, uh, again, as we learned throughout the project, so, so hard to find time in schools to devote the kind of work, the kind of time in schools to uh, dedicate to this kind of work. But they did have time to explore Canva as a template. And then they created their own infographics. And we're going to show you uh, their initial examples from the fall, and Cindy is just going to talk a little bit about this. So what's interesting is that the students, the these switched from posters to bookmarks, and the students spontaneously reformatted these into um, something that was suitable to be a bookmark. Now, I, I might say, only in my old age that perhaps the type gets a bit small. Um, but these are young eyes, they're young eyes, so it's fine. But the idea, I mean, these look like bookmarks. They're beautiful. They're really cool to have in the library to hand out. And if you look, some of the beginning design factors are being showed here. So stuff that we know inherently um, that you do when you're trying to make a page, you set up hierarchy. What are your most important ideas? How do you indicate hierarchy on a page that it's like, oh yeah, that makes sense. 
But when you have this big blank page in Canva to actually make sure that you're using that. So for instance, the planets, it's probably very hard for people to see them. They're in order. So making sure that you're ordering them to indicate their space in the world, um, adding in visuals. I, I mean, I've got to say there's some a little bit of decorative visuals here, but it's not most of them are supporting the information that they have in proximity to the visual. So most of these, even though they're not necessarily quantitative visualizations, it's all qualitative images that are supporting what the text says. And they all have really different looks to them, but none of them are necessarily difficult to read. I feel like the Zoom is probably not doing the one with the trees on a, a favor. It actually has a lot more contrast in it than it appears on screen. But yeah, I think these are just fantastic examples of, although you can see the influence of the templates, um, and templates are very convenient many times because they take the most common ways to organize ideas and they offer them to you. They definitely push back against the templates in service of the information that they wanted to share with people. And that's always really heartening for me from a design standpoint. Uh, yes, so as, as Cindy explained, uh, the teachers discovered themselves that using that template kind of uh, kind of forced the students into a certain way of thinking about it. But again, this was this was just a pilot. Uh, however, the teachers found that the having created the infographics was very useful as a roadmap or a guideline for the teachers for I'm sorry, for the students to be able to write their research papers. So it was really like a thoughtful uh, graphic organizer that they made that supported their their own writing. And from there, the teachers decided that they would like to change to PowerPoint in the lessons in the spring, uh, because that would allow for more flexibility and creativity than kind of locking the students into the uh, template. So we're going to hear about that next, and you're going to see how the, these uh, really just a brilliant pair of teachers decided to link the experience in the spring again to something that made sense within the structure of the school day, and that was the students' obligation to do science fair projects. So we're going to hear now about what happened in the spring. Thank you, Dr. Ramos. Um, yes, yeah, so in the next couple of slides, I will talk about over mean infographic lessons. I will introduce a timeline and I will show you some awesome students' infographic work. And I will also discuss the takeaways that we have from this amazing project. So, so first of all, I would like to just explain the timeline for the infographic lessons. So basically the students' final infographic work was designed or transferred based on their uh, school science fair poster, science fair pro project. So start from early February, 2023, um, students start their um, science experiment for their science fair project. So the students were divided into eight different groups to conduct different science experiments. And each group have two to three students and the teacher gave them a list of different science experience topic. The students can choose the topic and the experiments that they like and they want to work on. And um, the student had around three weeks to finish their uh, experiment. So from the late February, 2023, uh, all of the students had finished their data collection procedures and start in the stage of like analyzing data and putting data together in a poster format. And the science fair is actually happened in March 2nd, 2023. Um, what I want to emphasize is here is unlike other science fairs, so in this specific event, students did not give any opportunity to actually give the presentation or present their study in front of other people. Only their posters, only their board were displayed in the hallway. And um, after students uh, completing, finished their science fair posters, uh, they kind of started working on their infographics. So to help students and teachers to better understand infographic and design their infographic over team, Cindy actually provided one kickoff meeting and two infographic consolation sessions for students and teachers. Um, and Cindy will talk about the experience and the takeaway that he has from the consolation session. So, 
the students had nearly one month, 1.5 months to finish their infographic work. So that is the entire timeline for the mini infographic lesson. And next, I will go a little deeper uh, about each time frame to give you more information about the project. So science experiment, as I mentioned, um, students was working on a science experiment and their data and their result is actually the foundation of their infographic work. So here are some topic, like example topic that students was working on. So. This experiment um, on the right um, top is the students was trying to test out which brand of nail polish actually lasts longer. And this one in the left um, bottom is students was trying to figure out which popcorn brand, which pop popcorner brand actually pops more. And this one, the bigger the bigger one is the students who are trying to figure out the differences between long capacity between boys and girls. So it uses balloons to test out uh, whether boys has better long capacity or girl has better long capacity. And next is science fair poster. So um so on the left is the science fair poster template that this teacher gave students. So the students need to follow this template exactly. So they need to include everything listed in this template, including uh, search topic, hypothesis, procedure, conclusion, and implication. And they also need to use chart or diagram to present their data. And on the left are the two student science fair posters. So as we can see from the picture, they look very similar because they need to follow the exact requirements and the template. And then we are talking about transferring their school science fair poster to infographics. So, um, as I mentioned, after finishing their poster, they kind of transferred to infographics. Um, so all groups actually start using paper and color markers, color pencils to create their first draft of their infographic. And then they will uh, subsequently transfer their paper poster to a PowerPoint version. And um, uh, as again, uh, to help students better design their infographic, we provided two infographic consolation sessions and to give them opportunity to communicate with Cindy. And the teacher also mentioned that students are really excited about talking to experts outside of the school. And um, um, because up until now, students may need a couple more weeks or a couple more days to finish their final infographic uh, work. So in this presentation, we will just present the first draft of their students of the students infographic work and use them as data and evidence and so before I turn uh, the session to Cindy about her experience with the consolation sessions, I just want to give you a little information about the infographic consolation sessions. So we had two sessions with 30 minutes each. And um, Cindy met each student, student group individually to provide feedback and suggestions and answer their questions. And she met four groups during the first session and met the other four groups during the second session. So now I'm going to turn the presentation to Cindy to let her talk about her experience and takeaways. I, I do want to say it's really funny to me. We talked about this, but it didn't really sink in that because we were working with students and teachers that are under pseudonyms that a lot of the pictures are just me <laughs> in my office. And I'm like, wow, I really should have straightened up my bookshelf. But so the first thing um, that I wanted to say uh, from the consultation sessions is that every time I work in a K-12 school, I am reminded that I don't have the stamina um, but it is also bananas fun. So these students were so smart and, and it was such a great experience. It was also, I'm always in awe of the chaos management that you have to have to have a class happening. And then like my big head is on the, like the zoom board, but I'm talking to students, um, with audio and we did have like little technical things to work through. Like, no, you have to talk louder and I'm coming through the speakers and all of those kind of technical growing pains that happens when you try something like this, that's that ambitious. Um, 
when I first talked to the teachers, I think at first they were a little bit like, oh, we had hoped we would be a little bit farther on PowerPoint. Um, but I thought that was great because I think that, and it's part of my professional disciplinary practice as a designer, even when I do freelance work now, I start everything on paper. And I tell students all the time, I cannot draw. I cannot draw, but it doesn't hold me back. I can use digital tools. But I think that sometimes when you start on paper, you're not held, maybe it's optimism, but you don't get held back about what you might be able to do on the computer. So the, I, you get out of the way of the tool and your ideas start to come forward. And I think that it's helpful that you don't have a bank of clip art or other things and you can just keep refocusing on kind of your main the main points of doing an infographic. Who's your audience? What are you doing? So a question that I ask, even though I kind of knew the answer, um, was who is the infographic for? Where are you guys making these? Where are they going to be? And, you know, well, they're going to hang up. And it's like, okay, well, what do you think people know about the topic? So if you're doing something about popcorn, um, it would lead me to, and I said it a little bit more gently with the, the students, although I think they could have taken it. Normally I'm like, who cares? Like, I, why, why do people care about that? Why do people care about popcorn? It's like, well, you know, uh, well, I bet a lot of people eat popcorn. I bet a lot of popcorn is sold every year. I bet popcorn's probably getting more expensive. I bet it's a delicious treat enjoyed by many Americans. So that is why people care about it. You have to convince them. I'm not just being a jerk. I'm trying to have you think about why is this topic relevant in everyone's lives? Now, sometimes students really do me a solid and everyone picked like great topics that were just like, it was just like underhanded softballs about why, who cares? Nail polish, oh my gosh. Nail polish, of course, is relevant to people's lives. It's expensive, it's a pain to put on. So the long lasting nature or not of nail polish is really important. And one of their nail polishes was that was not as expensive, lasted, had a pretty decent kind of like length that it stayed on your fingers. And it was great because through these conversations within the chaos with the kind of mediating object of talking about the infographic design process, I was able to ask them, well, how did you figure that out? How did you guys test um, nail polish? So infographics, even outside of what they were making, just the conversations that we were able to have around their methods and who cares and how do you situate this idea in the landscape of personal relevance? Like, why is this relevant to people? So everyone had really great ideas. Um, the chocolate chip cookies, although I did accidentally like introduce the idea of salmonella kind of on accident because it was like, what's, I was like, oh, I'm so sorry. I was like, can you even eat unrefrigerated cookie dough? And they were like, I'm like, oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. I'm sure it's safe. Everyone's fine. It's fine. But because, you know, they came up with topics and I'm a pretty curious person. So I was genuinely had these conversations and it was all situated in the idea of like being a proxy for your future audience, because design, I mean, all communication, we know this, all reading and writing, it doesn't feel like it sometimes when you're in school, but it's a negotiation, especially when you're creating things, when you're writing based on your understanding, your background, and, and serving as, like I said, that proxy for your future audience. And it, I feel like infographics are easier um, with young people to kind of give them that meta understanding of why we make things, why we write, why we, you know, do oral presentations, why we design something. It just feels easier to have everyone remember. It's not just because your teachers don't like, you know, like because everyone's trying to ruin your life. It's because you're making things for other people to consume. And I think being able to take kind of pride in serving and making sure that you're giving the correct information, that becomes a little bit easier in the context of infographics. And then I was able to talk about like the elements of design, which as we go through some of them, or you know, as Sylvia goes through some of them, you know, did you use contrast? So did you make sure that things are readable? I love watching people make typefaces on paper because it's hard. Um, and how you have to be very careful about how big you scale them, especially once the markers come out and you don't have pencil anymore. And do you repeat elements? 
Um, do you put ideas that go together together? So you make kind of visual chunks of information thinking about your reader kind of driving through your infographic because it's not a word document. It's not immediately left to right, you know, scanning down the lines. Your eye is drawn to what has contrast and we make contracts with color. We make our biggest idea literally the biggest. Um, and, you know, you choose representative elements. And this is where I was very proud of the students. No one, when you, when you see these, as Sylvia goes through the slides, you'll see they, they drew balloons, they drew nail polish bottles, but it didn't, it was always in service of the understanding of the person that was reading it. It wasn't just decoration. So I thought that was, I thought that was pretty great. So I was trying to find the unmute button to share the screen. Thank you so much, Cindy, for sharing your experience and takeaway from uh, the consultation uh, session. So um, now I will present you some amazing students infographic work and kind of compare it with the, the science fair poster that I created. So the first group uh, was analyzing the long capacity between boys and girls. So they asked their classmates to boo out at the, the balloons and kind of um, Right, the size of the bloom as their data to compare their lung capacity. So as we can see from the picture, so their posters really follow the template, really follow the requirements. However, their infographic work are more colorful, more happier, and more uh, visual representation. So instead of use this really small chart with all those dots and unknown numbers, they use this two different sizes of bloom to represent their data. So the big bloom actually represent the boy group and the small, because the boy has a blow up bigger balloons and the small balloons actually, actually represent the girl group. So as we can see from the infographic, they use more easy way, easy, more um, clear virtual representation of their data, which they can clearly understand the data and uh, interpret the data. And um, so the next group is the popcorn group. So um, um, they were trying, as I mentioned, they were trying to test out which brand of popcorn actually pops more. And um, again, their, their, their science fair poster looks awesome. They follow the requirement. They have this little decorative uh, elements in their poster and their infographic looks awesome as well. And the one interesting that thing that I want to share in the presentation is that actually the infographic capture more information from their experiments. So yeah. if you can look their procedure that they mentioned here, they not only calculated, counted the, the kernels that pops, they also counted the kernels that did not pop after they put in the microwave. However, in the data that they share in the poster, there's no way that they can actually represent those unpopped kernels. The number of unpopped kernels is not really present in this chart. Mm -hmm. However, in the infographic, you can see they draw this little unpopped kernels. This, those are popped. So this are uh, unpopped kernels. So they definitely capture this really important information in their infographics because we did not give them any template. We did not ask them to represent any data. They can represent, they can pre present and draw any data they want in their infographic. <laughs> So infographic definitely capture more detail in their uh, science experiments and capture more details about their thinking process. Mm -hmm. And um, the next group was testing which uh, brand of nail polish actually lasts longer. So the, in the experiments actually you can see from those pictures, all students actually put the nail polish on their hand and keep them for a week and take pictures every day during the week. And um, you can see from their infographic and uh, poster, we have more picture in their science fair poster. However, um, they did not really put pictures in their first draft, but they will, like the teacher will help them put the pictures in their final uh, infographic work. Um, however, as we can see from the infographic, they kind of analyzed data in a different way. So in the poster, you just put all the picture out um, and trying to, to see which uh, 
uh, nail polish brand last longer. However, in their infographic, they actually create three different bottles of nail polish, and each bottle actually represent one brand of nail polish. They have the price and they have the performance of nail polish in this bottle. So if you want to ask them, like, which is cheapest, cheap, how's the performance of the nail polish, they can just go directly to this brand and tell you everything about this brand of nail polish. However, in terms of infographic knowledge, the students definitely not really good at choosing the background color and the test color, which the contrast that Cindy mentioned in the previous slide, uh, Cindy also provided the feedback about their infographic design. They will definitely change it in their final infographic work. And the next group is trying to test out whether students prefer drinking fountain water or sink water. So again, their um, poster look really uh, follow the templates, really follow the requirements. However, they use more vivid visual representation to present their data in their infographic. So instead of using this um, chart, they use this blue area to present um, the number of people who like this type of water. So this is uh, fountain water and they have more blue area, which means 21 people like um, water from drink fountain and that there are less blue area means less people, six people like the sink, uh, the water from the sink. So again, uh, infographic gave them more um, space for them to present their data in a different way or in a colorful and vivid way. So the last group uh, was working on finding out whether people can tell the different skittle flavors with their eyes covered. And again, this is a typical science fair poster following the template. Um, and this is more like colorful and happy poster uh, infographic that they created. Um, different from other group, this group also add their first language Spanish in their infographic. So this is English version, this is Spanish version. So um, this is the multicultural elements, multilingual elements that we really want to emphasize in our project. And um, to summarize, like what I was mentioned in the previous slides from students' work, um, the first takeaways that we have is uh, infographic definitely provides space for students' creativity. Students can draw whatever they want um, in their uh, infographic balloons, pop coins, water bottles, nail polish bottles. And they also use different figures and pictures and visual representations to present their data. And some students also include their first language in the posters, which is awesome. And also the infographic consolation sessions actually make students aware of the key elements of infographic, like who is the audience, what this, why this topic is important, and some really important design knowledge like colors, contrast, graphic, fort and size. And also, as I mentioned, students include their first language infographic, and we're also trying to provide opportunities for them to actually present their science studies, science experiment in their first language. And last but not least, uh, infographic definitely enhances students' understanding of science literature as multimodal, multilingual, and multicultural, and also reflects multimodal nature of science as a discipline. And so the overall, the, the mean infographic lesson went super smooth, but we did uh, face or encounter some challenges. So the first is unexpected technology, technical difficulties when uh, teacher and students were trying to use uh, infographic tools like Canva and PowerPoint. And also creating the infographic took longer than teacher expected um, because of school schedule, because of spring break, because of SOL. Um, the, the process actually taking longer than teachers expected. We were hoping to have students finish their infographic work uh, by the first week of May. However, we need to um, postpone it to uh, May 19th. And last, we have, um, we have found that teachers really hard to balance infographic lesson with other teaching tasks, like they had to prepare for SOL. And although we were facing some challenges, we also see tons of opportunities for infographic lessons in all schools. Um, so at the beginning of the, the project, at the beginning of the training, we talk to teacher and say, we don't want this infographic lesson as a burden or as an extra task 
to be, to that you have to carry throughout the semester. We want you to find a way to incorporate infographic lesson into your daily teaching practices. So teachers tried multiple ways to incorporate infographic lesson into their teachings. So for example, the Padlet infographic lesson, that was not required. We just encouraged teachers to use them as a Padlet lesson. So teachers quickly find out that this infographic can help her help her students to write a research paper. Um, so she just spontaneously used infographic as a scaffolding tool in, their, in her class. And also um, adding infographic to the science fair projects, also the teacher's idea. So we can tell that teachers um, can see the potential of infographic, can see the potential of infographic helping her teaching and helping her student learning. And also teacher also discovered various way to showcase her students infographic work she does not want to just throw out the infographic after this project. She wants to let everybody know her students' awesome infographic work. So she suggests us to present at Multicultural Night. We actually plan to do that. However, due to the, like, the schedules, we cannot finish it before the Multicultural Night. Uh, but we will definitely create some community events. Uh, for students to actually present their studies to their families, siblings, friends, and other classmates. And the teachers also mentioned the library bookmarks as uh, really good opportunities for students to showcase their work. And last but not least, we got huge support from school principal and school district coordinator to help us con connect, make connection with the teachers and the school principals also uh, help us uh, create the space for the kickoff meeting. And he will also help us uh, creating opportunities for future community events. And um, that's all about the mean infographic lesson. I will turn the presentation to Dr. Kim to talk about the implications. Thank you so much, Sylvia, uh, who has been in the classroom with weird contact with our teachers and students all the time for this project. So we were really excited to hear about all these stories. Well, we also hope you enjoyed watching the actual hands-on activities version of infographics work with our teachers and students in the classroom, in the science classroom, which demonstrated a, demonstrated a range of progressive development in our students' thinking, creativity, understanding of the science concept, as well as their understanding of the designing process itself, right? Using all sorts of multimodal components to represent their learning, their concepts, their creativity. So you probably have also noted that these students are starting to represent their ideas in their home language, which we would like to see more in the final products. So we are looking forward to seeing these uh, digital infographics work in probably June, and we hope to share their final products with you in some future presentations. So taken all, we hope that our TTS project can provide a model for embedded infographic lessons in science classrooms with multilingual learners in ways that empower their multilingual and multicultural assets and to offset the limitation of English only language heavy instructional approaches that delimit our multilingual learners uh, potential to engage in and express their science learning in multiple creative ways. This project we believe uh, showcases an effective teacher collaboration model as well in which ESOL and science um, or content teachers can work together to maximize um, the multilingual learners potential to succeed in their science disciplinary uh, learning. Finally, as we have witnessed how our teachers designed and implemented science standards aligned lesson, even within the constraint of structural curriculum of school and the limited time frame allocated for this infographic project. So we are uh, give, uh, given this new possibility, we plan to expand this potential in our next step with our teachers and their new students. So uh, we hope to share more insights about our project in the coming years, once our teacher participants and their students start to engage in a more full-fledged infographics projects that's scheduled from this fall, 2023. So as of now, this is all what we wanted, uh, all that we wanted to share with you today. And we would like to welcome any comments, questions, and insights about our project. Thank you so much.
So I think we have uh, one participant today. If you have any questions or comments, feedback, uh, please feel free to unmike, unmute yourself and speak, or you can use the chat box. Or you can also email us um, at the email addresses at the last slide if you have any questions or feedback for us.